Diet and lifestyle changes have proved helpful in delaying or preventing uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, this, however, is not the case with type 1 diabetes, which manifests suddenly. Currently, over a million adults and 200,000 youth are living with type 1 diabetes in a country. What is life like for them, for their families, and what can be done to improve the management um, for this type of diabetes? For that conversation, I'd like to welcome to the stage Scott Whitaker, President and CEO of AdvaMed, and Steve Ubel, who is the President and CEO of Pharma. Uh, the Hills National Correspondent, Reed Wilson, will return to the stage for this interview. All right. Well, back for one more conversation. Scott and Steve, thank you so much for being sure. here and, and welcome. Um, yeah. I want to start uh, the conversation with a, another little personal note. Uh, both of you have personal connections uh, to diabetes. Uh, talk about a little uh, how, how that has affected your career paths and what you're doing now at AdvaMed and at Pharma. Well, my daughter, thanks, Reed. Thanks for being here. Steve, thanks for hosting this uh, and Pharma for your support and all the work that Pharma and Pharma companies do on diabetes, type 1 specifically. It's a great organization, great company, as I wanted to say that up front. Uh, my daughter is now 14 years old. She was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was 7. Um, we had no family history of it in our family, and as some of you probably know, usually there's some type of family history connected to it. So for us, it was a total surprise. Um, she exhibited the symptoms. I knew a bit about it, so I wondered if it might be the case. Um, took her to the doctor, and they said, get to the emergency room right now. Her blood sugar numbers were off the chart. Uh, and since then, it's been you know, a bit of a grind, honestly. I think one of the things about type 1 diabetes versus type 2 diabetes is beyond it not being fully understood the difference between the two diseases, um, it is a chronic condition that you can do nothing about other than provide insulin on a regular basis. And uh, for a child, particularly, managing that, the highs and the lows and the continuation of shots over and over again uh, is exhausting for parents and you can imagine how exhausting it is for a child. And I know Steve has his own story and has been through this as well. Um, but it also has a tr takes a tremendous toll on the healthcare system. The number of times that we go to the doctor for visits, the number of medical products that we use, the cost associated with caring for a child with diabetes is significant, which is why innovative therapies that treat and eventually cure this disease are so important for the system overall. It has guided to some degree my path as well professionally. Uh, one of the reasons I came to AdvaMed, beyond the fact that Steve left and moved on somewhere else, uh, <laughs> was because the, these companies are on the front edge of managing diabetes in a way that makes patients' lives so much better. And I can talk about that a little bit more. What I've seen from an innovation standpoint over the course of seven years in the medical technology world has been transformative to the daily life of my daughter. And um, it makes a huge difference. And what's going on in the pharma and biotech space is so, uh, so exciting as well. Yeah, no, so, so uh, most people remember the moment that their loved one was diagnosed. For me, it was almost surreal. Um, I was at AdvaMed, actually, we had a board meeting and we had this uh, life-changing innovation um, public awareness effort, and we just shown the board a video of um, pump technology and the benefits of insulin pump technology. And I'll never forget, you know, told the story of a, a mother whose toddler had just been diagnosed, and the mother was talking about the fact that the toddler, you know, really looked at the mom and was like, "What are you doing, giving me an insulin injection and inflicting so much pain when you're supposed to be protecting me?" And uh, so a few minutes after that video ran, my wife called to say that our, our son had been diagnosed with type 1. Mm. And uh, like Scott, we had no family history. And so it sort of came out of the blue. Um, and it is a grind. I mean, I have to say we're two years in. Um, but you really do have to appreciate the fact that you know, my son Chris tests his blood sugar you know, throughout the day, four or five times a day, takes insulin four or five times uh, a day. You know, when I had to give him his first shot, he literally ran out the front door. Mm -hmm. And uh, very little prepares you as a parent for, for a moment like that. Um, but it is a very exciting time, and, and I'm really optimistic about the future. And I've taken about 50 trips uh, since I took this job to go out and visit with the companies and to meet with the leadership of the companies, but also the R&D leaders and tour the labs and really get a feel for you know, where the science is going. 
and uh, Scott and I could talk about our respective fields and, and what's happening, but I'm more optimistic than ever that as we unravel the human genome and understand more about human biology, that we're going to cure this disease, uh, and in the short run, we're gonna make it a lot more manageable uh, for patients to, to uh, manage the condition over time. Uh, but it is, you know, to pick up on Scott's uh, comments, you know, the daily experience is challenging. And uh, just one short story uh, about my son. I recently dropped him off at the mall uh, for sort of a group date. You know, he's going, he's 13 now. He's going with a group of his uh, guy friends and a few girls. And I was asking him on the way in, I was like, well, should I give you an insulin? You know, what are you going to eat so that we can plan for this and dad doesn't have to be hovering around? Um, and he said, don't worry, dad. You know, I'm not going to eat. It'll be fine. And I ran an error in the mall, and I was running back uh, to the car, and I ran into my son in the food court, you know, with a with a you know shake in one hand and a burger in the other, and uh, knowing that the, this story is not going to end well, right. you know, and right. and, uh, and yet, you know, he basically had had no interest in my delivering insulin at the moment. So what happens in our family is I called my wife. I said, you know, we have this issue. You're, shuttle diplomacy. You're going to have to come to the mall and, right. and intervene. And, and I, I tell that story because it happens with a fair amount of regularity that there's all kinds of psychosocial and, and you know, additional variables that come into play when you're trying to manage this uh, condition. Yeah. You've both talked just in your initial answers about uh, why you, about the fact that you are excited about the advancements in the field. What are the next steps? What what are we going to see come on the market in the next few years? What are we going to see being tested in the next few years? So let me give you a sense from my perspective broadly, and then maybe a couple specific examples of things that I'm, I'm excited about. In the medical technology space, I think the convergence of traditional IT with what has been traditional medical technology is unbelievably exciting. Um, and the personalization of that is amazing as well. We're seeing things now that seven years ago were almost science fiction-like. Um, and the progress they're making is even more exciting long term. I'll give you an example of it. So when my daughter was diagnosed, uh, uh, Steve talked about this with Christopher, we were giving her several, seven insulin shots a day on average. Um, sometimes it was a little more, sometimes it was a little less. Um, pricking her finger 10 to 12 times to get the blood out into the blood glucose monitor so we could get her reading. Recently, we uh, talked her into changing over to a new insulin pump and wearing a continuous glucose monitor. Those two products, the insulin pump's not as new and innovative, but the CGM is amazingly innovative. So now she wears a tubeless insulin pump in her side. She wears a continuous glucose monitor in her other side, and they're, they're fairly small, relatively speaking. They don't speak to one another yet, but they speak to the technology that I carry. So her continuous glucose monitor updates her <coughs> blood sugar levels every five minutes, right? And if she goes high on my Apple Watch, I'll get a beeping signal and a notice of what her high blood glucose numbers are. If she goes low, the same thing happens. She gets it also on her phone and then a device that she carries. Now that is transformative technology to the care of a type 1 diabetic. You have to get over the hurdle of having your child be willing to wear it, which to Steve's point, the social aspect of that is very difficult for kids. But once they get there and accept the technology, it changes the life of the child. It changes the life of the parents as well. Steve knows this. When we were first diagnosed, we were waking up at 2 or 3 o'clock every morning. We would go into her room. Uh, try not to wake her up, prick her finger, draw blood, test her blood, decide at that point in time whether she needed food, could continue sleeping, or we'd give her a shot at 2 o'clock in the morning, right? Today, I wake up and check my iPhone beside my bed, and I just go, oh, she's 220, she's got three uh, insulin units on board, she's going to go down to about 150, she's okay, and I go back to sleep. And I never have to wake her up, right? If she's very high, I get a notice, we know what to do. So that technology has been transformative, the CGM technology and the convergence of those two. I think what is next and most exciting, if you look at what's been done at FDA, the first, what people call an artificial pancreas, but it's really a hybrid closed loop system that Medtronic got approved by the FDA. And by the way, FDA did a fantastic job in the process of getting them to approval, which is the next step in closing that loop. So rather than 
just communicating to my iPhone or my watch or my daughter's iPhone or watch, uh, they've set up smart algorithms so that the CGM communicates directly with the pump that she's wearing or the individual's wearing, right? And it automatically changes her dosage based, based on her blood sugar levels to either prevent a hyperglycemic or a hypoglycemic event, both of which are incredibly costly to the healthcare system and incredibly costly to the emotions of parents and children, right? So that technology is amazing. FDA has approved it. It's on its way to the market. The first one will be on the market in 2017. Um, and then moving from the hybrid to the fully closed loop, which is more like an artificial pancreas, that is going to change the lives of millions of people um, in a meaningful way. Now, there are a lot of hurdles that you have to get over to get to that point. And I'll, I'll say, as I said earlier, FDA has done a great job in working with the Medtronics of the world to get them there. But then you have regulatory agencies that have to make determinations about whether they're going to pay for it and how much that's going to penetrate the market as a result of it. And you hope that they're smart enough to make the right innovative decisions for patients that aren't just budget, budget driven, right? So from my standpoint, the closed loop system, the CGM technology is amazingly transformative. And I think uh, from a management standpoint, it's going to be uh, so welcome to the type one community. Steve, what are we going to see on the pharma side? Well, just to, I completely agree with Scott, and I just comment on my own son. It's frustrating for a technology person not to be able to encourage your your son or loved one to take advantage of these technologies. And right now, he's been unwilling to do that. He's into sports and doesn't want to wear the technology. And um, you know, in talking to the community and people that have been through this before, they basically have said, "Well, some sometime between 13 and 30, yeah. you know, he may uh, adopt it." Yeah. And, and so, you know, everyone has to kind of come to the place where they're ready for the technology. Um, and I hope that day is soon for, for my son. On the pharma side, uh, tremendous advances on the horizon. Um, I would start with things like uh, smart insulin. Uh, we already have, uh, you know, insulin that provides a, a, a base of insulin support for a 24-hour period. Uh, but the next uh, iteration and innovation you know, may allow for a certain level of insulin to be inert in the body until it is, it is required. Uh, oral insulin, you, th you think about the thousands of shots that I've poured into my poor son. I mean, the idea that you would be able to take oral insulin would be a huge uh, advance. Encapsulation technology, you know, uh, Scott talked about the difference between type 1 and type 2. You know, type 1 is an autoimmune disorder where your body's immune system attacks the beta cells in your pancreas and they no longer produce uh, sufficient levels of, of insulin. So what's happening, if you envision it uh, through encapsulation technology, it's almost like a shark tank. You would put beta cells back in the body, you know, typically in a, a plastic scaffold that would be inserted in, in sort of your back fat. You might have two years' worth of beta cells um, encapsulated there, but it'd have to be in that, in that uh, scaffolding to prevent your body from attacking the beta cells again. So essentially the shark tank um, analogy is that blood could flow through and uh, you wouldn't have clotting and so forth, but it would be protected from the T cells in your body that would be attacking the beta cells. Um, but again, for a two-year period, you would be, uh, you know, you would not be insulin dependent in the same way that, that uh, my son or Scott's daughter is today. Um, other advances that are on the horizon, cell therapies, um, you know, that would actually either re-energize the beta cells in the body or take alpha cells or other types of cells and uh, convert them into the same capacity of, of producing insulin. All of these things are uh, in, the, in the pipeline, being uh, tried in clinical trials uh, around the country. So it is a very exciting time uh, in the field. What do each of you want to see uh, come off of Capitol Hill in the 115th Congress uh, that would help better advance these, the, the, what's on the horizon, and better serve those with diabetes? Yeah, 21st Century Cures is a great start. Uh, there are a lot of provisions in that from a broad med tech standpoint from a patient standpoint that help improve the system, mm -hmm. both on the regulatory side and on the payment side. So first I would acknowledge that that is progress and it's policy like that that changes the way patients get access to innovations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. 
I think broadly what I would say is I would hope that a Congress and a new administration at HHS, at both CMS and then at FDA, embraces the notion of a patient-centered innovation model and not a budget-centric model. Oftentimes, if you think about innovations, whether it's in the pharma space or if it's in the medical technology space, you find oftentimes at CMS that they're focused on that one-year budget window, right? How's it going to score? What's the cost going to be during that first window? And as a result of that, they don't fully embrace the, the innovation. But if you think about it, and type one's a great example, if you think about innovation and allowing patients to get access to better and innovative products over the long term, the savings associated with smart policies that support patient-centric innovation will be transformative not only to the patient, but will drive down costs significantly to the healthcare system overall. You look at how much it costs to treat a, uh, one incident of a hypoglycemic or a hyperglycemic visit, right? On average, about $17,000 for one hospital visit, right? Over the course of a lifetime, kids and now adults will go in for those visits periodically because their insulin is not working right, their blood sugar numbers are out of control. With the right innovative policies, if people can get access to these products, you're gonna avoid that. Think about it particularly in underserved areas in the Medicaid population, right? And then in the senior population for type one and type two. The number of reduced doctor visits and reduced hospital visits that would occur as a result of embracing technology that might cost a little more up front, but over the long term save tons of money, emotional health, and physical health, that's what we need both Congress and the administration to think through. And I will say, uh, I think Tom Price was a great nominee for HHS. I think he understands it. Surgeon, physician, understands the healthcare system really well. And so from our perspective, that's really encouraging. But an innovative patient-focused policy as opposed to just a budget-focused policy, I think is, is critically important to us. Yeah, I would agree with Scott on the uh, 21st Century Cures uh, effort is a great first start and really big things and small things within the legislation. For example, uh, provisions that will allow the FDA to go outside the typical federal model of hiring. You know, FDA is a chronic issue of recruiting and retaining top talent, um, so that will help. Uh, Scott mentioned the convergence of, of IT and technology. Um, you know, the randomized clinical control trial will always be the, the gold standard, but we're, we have other data sources uh, today, data that will be collected, for example, in Scott's daughter's CGM. You know, that so-called real-world evidence over time is going to give the FDA more information, uh, hopefully with which to, to make regulatory decisions and speed patient access to markets. So, you know, I could go on with, with other provisions. Um, of the 21st Century Cures Act, but I think it's a very significant step in the right direction. The user fee agreements that our respective uh, sectors negotiate with the agency, uh, along with other stakeholders, also I think will modernize the regulatory uh, apparatus and allow FDA to use more information sources to make uh, regulatory decisions with. Uh, but Scott makes a great point just about the, the whole ecosystem. You know, we all know that most of healthcare spending is driven by chronic disease and, and patients with multiple chronic disease, 80, 90 percent. And our respective constituents are working on interventions that stand the best chance of ameliorating those costs uh, through redu reducing uh, hospitalizations and, and other uh, institutional costs that are by far the largest expen expenditures in healthcare. So I do think we need to continue to open the aperture um, in the health policy discussion you know, to make sure that we're looking at costs holistically and not myopically uh, on the short-term costs or, or one aspect of the system versus another. Well, let's look at those, those costs myopically for a second. Uh, the costs of insulin are, are rising. Why? You want to take this one, Scott? <laughs> uh, you know, actually, I think uh, the insulin space, something, you know, I'm fairly close to, is one of the most competitive, um, you know, in, in the industry. And if you step back from it, we, we now have this evolving marketplace that's increasingly sophisticated. So you've got three to five payers, you've got three PBMs that control 80% of the market, and they've got extraordinary leverage uh, to restrain costs, including excluding from coverage um, one of the, the manufacturers or, or 
putting another manufacturer on a preferred <coughs> tier uh, for coverage purposes. So recently, one of the three um, manufacturers in the insulin space you know, just laid off 1,000 people, uh, sadly uh, abandoned their, their oral <coughs> insulin uh, research program. And that's a byproduct of, of the pressure in the marketplace uh, today. So if, if you talk to the manufacturers of insulin, they will tell you that while most of the media is focused on list price, through the process of a competitive marketplace and negotiations with payers and PBMs, on a net basis, pricing has been very flat, if not negative, uh, in recent years. So I think through the process of, of uh, you know, hearings that are coming up and, and other education efforts, there'll be a greater appreciation for how that marketplace operates. We've heard uh, some criticism from people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren mm -hmm. of the pharma space in particular. Um, are, you, are you concerned at all that a focus from, uh, from Capitol Hill, specifically from one, what seems to be a rising uh, factor in one party, uh, is, is going to put pressure on the industry? Well, I think that uh, very little brings people together in Washington uh, these days. But one thing has, and that's a uh, spirit or support for innovation. So you look at the 21st Century Cures effort. You look at the brain initiative the administration has led on, the precision medicine initiative, the cancer moonshot. Uh, people are coming together in support because they see that we're on the cusp of a golden era in medicine. We've been talking about the advances that are on the horizon and the incredible economic and public health gains that can flow from those. Um, so I, I hope that um, we don't have a, a lopsided discussion or isolated criticisms that distract us from realizing the potential uh, that's in front of us. And, and I do think on a broad bipartisan basis, people want to make sure that we're harness, harnessing the, the progress that's uh, possible. Yeah, this is uh, in Steve's space primarily, but let me, let me just say this, right? When you're looking at specific incidents of crisis, it's important, it's important that you think about the entire health ecosystem as well. <clears throat> if it weren't for the companies who make that insulin and allow us to treat our kids, right? It was, it's essentially a long-term debilitating disease, right? So as you think about pricing issues, think about the patients too. And what if they didn't have access? And how's it going to affect the next generation of insulin and the next generation of products, right? NIH is a wonderful institution, and they do great work. But it's the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical companies that are creating cures. And it's important for people to understand that uh, as they're looking at pharma and bio and as they're looking at med tech as well, right? We're on the front edge of treating people and make people's lives better. And there's just no, there's no way around that. And you have to look at the entire ecosystem of innovation in order to make smart decisions, in my opinion. Mm, that's a great point. I mean, oh, I was just going to say, it, it, broadly speaking, you need the right tax policy, regulatory right. policy, reimbursement policy that supports innovation um, to ensure that we continue to make you know, medical progress. And, and, and to Scott's point, the NIH is a fantastic institution. Our industry is, I think, the leading industry across all sectors in terms of R&D investment at a multiple of what NIH invests. And it's not that this is a competition. Yeah. This is a complementary, collaborative right. uh, relationship that industry enjoys with NIH. And we have a world-leading ecosystem uh, that has led you know, our country to really lead the world in the development of, of better treatments and cures. And we should all be proud of that. Uh, we heard a little bit earlier from Congressman Reid about uh, the Republican effort to replace the Affordable Care Act, which looks like it'll gain some steam as the 115th Congress kicks off. As they consider a replacement, what elements are you watching? What's going what's to impact the med tech business? What's going to impact the pharma business? And can this whole effort be used to uh, bolster diabetes care, to bolster diabetes research? Uh, I'm going to go back to the innovation ecosystem and the first thing that they need to address as they're looking at the re repeal and replace model uh, is the device tax. And I know it's an issue we've talked about a lot, but that is a job killing, innovation killing tax policy. And I think the first thing they need to do is repeal that, right? I mean, it affects in a real way products, the next generation of products that are coming to market. And that's a, a it may be important to us, but it's a critically important component uh, to patients and the broad ecosystem as well. Um, coverage is important 
to everybody, right? Private coverage and public coverage. From our perspective, giving patients access to innovative therapies is where we think the focus should be, right? So I look at the federal programs primarily now, right? And you see decisions that are made at CMS right now that don't support new innovative products. That has an impact on whether or not private insurance is gonna make those determinations as well. Um, there are a number of cases, CGMs not being covered by Medicare, for example, which is just bad innovative healthcare policy, right? And that has a trickle down effect on the broader healthcare system. There are other uh, issues in the, uh, in, the, in the pump space where you're not getting coverage that don't make a lot of sense. So I think making sure that federal policy is right and the impact that will have on private coverage is really important as well. And connecting those two is, is important. But overall, I'll go back to the same thing. As you're thinking about coverage, right, which is essentially what's a, what this is about, making sure that more people get access to insurance to provide more coverage for innovative treatments, having a strong FDA, having a thoughtful and responsive CMS impacts the whole ecosystem, and making sure you're focused on that, I think, is really important. Yeah, I think um, you know the prism with which we'll be looking at um, replace proposals and, and really all healthcare reforms is do they enhance the private market? Do they improve patient access to innovative therapies? Or do they further distort the market and, and make it more difficult for patients to access the therapies they need? And, and so, you know, we'll be working with the administration and both sides of the aisle as, as we go forward. And one of the concerns that we've had under the existing ACA is the uh, devolution in the quality of insurance. I mean, the reality is that patients are being asked to pay more for their health care and more for their medicines, and oftentimes patients have challenges when trying to access the medicines they need. And uh, a big reason for that is that out-of-pocket exposure has grown for patients uh, before they reach their deductible. So in, in many cases, you have combined deductibles or a higher deductible being placed on um, you know, pharmaceutical benefit as opposed to medical services or, or other benefits. So we have to make sure in whatever system uh, that we're moving towards that we keep an eye on affordability and, and look at ways uh, that we can encourage patients um, to have access, you know, before they reach the deductible. So things like ensuring that discounts that our companies negotiate with payers and PBMs are passed along to patients. We're looking at HSAs and, and ensuring that as we, you know, look at coupling HSAs and high deductible plans that IRS could be uh, looking at defining that in a way that provides more first dollar coverage for patients. You know, these are the kinds of, of things that we'll be focused on as the debate unfolds. All right. We'll end with uh, hopefully an optimistic note. How far away are we from a point where we can either cure type 1 diabetes with a, a pharmaceutical uh, a solution or uh, if we've got a, a device that is going to make things uh, essentially normal for those who suffer from it? So it, It's so hard to make that prediction. I, I would say sooner than many people expect if the right policies in, are in place to support companies who are trying to innovate. And certainly in our lifetime, I think, I would like to think in the next five to 10 years, there's gonna be transformative products on the market that get to that point. Whether we get there by then, I, I don't know. But I will say, if the wrong policies are in place, right, it will impede progress and it'll make certain that you don't see a cure and you don't see better treatments for a longer period of time. That's why federal policy matters. And it's really important that uh, individuals who are making that policy understand the connection between companies who are innovating and the policies that impact patients at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're gonna spend over the next 10 or 15 years, $2.4 trillion on healthcare. 85% um, of that is gonna be on things other than biopharmaceutical and other interventions. But I would argue that 15% is the most important investment we can make in, in the health of, of uh, our fellow citizens. And personally, my own view is I think we're at a tipping point around diabetes interventions. I agree with Scott that in the next five to 10 years, we are gonna see significant innovations that are really at a minimum going to uh, make it uh, a lot more manageable. Um, you know, I think about the pump technology and just 
you, know, you look at the iPhone and, and the sort of iterative improvements that have been made, we'll have smaller uh, pump technology. It'll be less of, of an issue for patients to gravitate uh, towards it. You know, micro patch pumps, you know, think about little patches that would have uh, tentacles, um, many smaller widths than a human hair that could deliver insulin, you know, depending on your weight and other, other uh, variables. There's some just incredibly uh, exciting technology on the front. So whether we have a cure in 10 years, I don't know. But we're going to have some very significant breakthroughs that I think are going to make it much easier to manage. All right. Scott Whitaker, Good. Stephen Eubel, thank you both so much for taking the time. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm.